Hi, welcome to Mission 919. Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, a few uh, interviews and uh, lectures. The first one is uh, by um, uh, is an interview with Esperanza Spalding on the show Radio Open Source with Christopher Lydon. And um, <clears throat> this interview, uh, the show uh, aired uh, in uh, April of 2019. I think it was April 5th, 2019. Um, basically, uh, Esperanza Spalding is a musician, uh, originally well steeped in the jazz tradition, but now is less uh, comfortable calling herself uh, solely a jazz musician. Um, she is, she taught at Berklee School of Music and now uh, teaches at Harvard. And um, I think one of the most important things uh, about her interview is um, <clears throat> she talks about art as a way of um, reacting to processing experience and that the uh, communication of music is in a sense embodied by the listener that uh, an experience that one encounters with music is experienced in the emotions and in the body itself. And that may not necessarily be able to be translated into language readily. Some people may not be able to translate it at all, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen or that it's not important. Also, uh, she sees herself um, as someone who um, cannot be uh, tied down or uh, reduced to um, a, um, a category or a lineage even as part of an archive for example the jazz tradition um, she sees herself as someone who has to be able to uh, evolve and innovate and explore um, and improvise um, without regard to those exterior um, identifications, categories, um, values even. Um, and because she has had some success and because she's also part of, uh, you know, uh, as part of uh, teaching in, in, in uh, academia, she has, a, she has more freedom to do uh, these things than some other artists who are uh, totally dependent on gigs and um, you know record labels and promotion and so forth and so on. Um, yeah, and she sees she sees art and really life itself as a pro as a continual process of evolving and devolving, of developing and growing in complexity and then decaying, falling apart, and then reconstituting reintegrating disintegrating and re and integrating or reintegrating and this is what happens in life and this is what happens in art in particular and in art is a is one way in which this process is more readily uh, accepted um, <clears throat> okay i want to do a brief discussion of uh professor ajani ajani and Shofar's interview about Afrofuturism. Um, <clears throat> essentially, Afrofuturism, according to Professor Ajani, is um, alternate realities regarding um, people of African descent. So it's it's a projection of projection of yourself and of your community into a possible future or and or it's a projection of yourself and your community or at least aspects of your community into an alternate present so you're projecting yourself into the future uh, f in, in, in an imaginary way so that you will be in the future in a physical way. You are sort of invoking 
your future selves and or you're invoking an alter alternate present. So there's aspects of the present that you would like to change and you imagine an alternative present and thereby invoking that present into reality. Or at least this is the ambition uh, that's part of Afrofuturism. Um, it talks about how in the 50s, 60s, before, after, there were very few uh, black people present in any science fiction or fantasy uh, narratives, whether uh, in books or comic books or film. And that the term Afrofuturism was coined in the 90s. And of course, Octavia Butler is probably the most uh, famous and uh, prominent uh, practitioner of science fiction among African American writers. Um, but that, you know, now uh, there are many other writers, uh, uh, you know, producing work. He also talks about how musicians were probably the first Afrofuturists in some ways. People like Earth, Wind, and Fire, Parliament, Funkadelic, Sun Ra, um, and others, and even, of course, now today, Janelle Monet. Um, he talks about how Harriet Tubman was kind of an Afrofuturist because she projected a possible future of freedom, sort of centering on the North Star as a way to carry uh, uh, enslaved Africans to, a, to an alternate reality of freedom. Um, even one could say that the African-American religious tradition, which looks at the Bible uh, in many ways, focused on the Hebrew tradition of uh, captivity in Egypt and how African-Americans were sort of a reiteration of the Hebrew uh, oppressed people trying to escape from Pharaoh's clutches. That in a way is also kind of an Afro-futurist move um, so, um, yeah, so, okay, so, um, the interview, uh, dialogue, really, between, um, Cornell West and Bell Hooks, I want to discuss, um, is a very, it's very interesting, it's very well done, kind of improvisatory, improvisational, uh, you can tell that they've been friends for a long time um, and they're able to riff off of one another. Uh, they're saying very, very many um, profound things, but there's also a lot of humor, subtext going on. So it's uh, entertaining as well as uh, informative and enlightening. But, um, okay, now whereas Esperanza Spaulding is f primarily a practitioner, um, Cornel West is primarily an archivist. He is a keeper of the lineage. He's someone who, he's, he's an African American equivalent of the Malian uh, jelly or jolly, or the term that we usually use is griot. So he knows all of the tradition and is able to access it um, in the moment. Uh, and so, he makes what well, he he, ha, he has some very interesting observations. He talks about his experience teaching prisoners for decades, from the from the eighties to the present. No, from the late seventies. And he talks about how the prisoners today have fewer spiritual resources. And he talks about the decay in the in the popular music and how uh, you know music in the fifties and sixties and in the seventies uh, had a broader range. And he talks about how. Uh, black male, black masculinity was performed uh, among in in and among the music, um, using the falsetto as a form of vulnerability, as a form of of being in touch with with emotions and love and desire for intimacy, and that a lot of that has receded or disappeared. And he sees that as a as a um, a negative uh, aspect of the culture related to what's the 
related to our political regression, say since the 80s from the Reagan era on, uh, perhaps you know with the current upsurge in political activity, maybe this is a, a time for changing that. Let's hope. Uh, but that's an interesting observation, you know, that there's a connection between the social and political life of the people and it's and the art that's manifested um, uh, in tandem. Um, and perhaps these things sort of uh, impact each other. That the, the more of a recession there is in these in the social political life, the more there's a recession or a degradation of the uh, of the art arts of the uh, artistic production of a of a group of people. Anyway, it's an idea. And then the last one I want to talk about is. Um, uh, Joseph, uh, James Baldwin and the moral responsibility of the artist and in that one he in that uh, uh, lecture given in 1963 which is it seems in almost every aspect completely uh, contemporary um, he talks about uh, the african-american tradition being a tragic one and that african-american culture is in touch with the tragic nature of life uh, but that the, the American tradition is wedded to a notion of innocence um, and uh, does not want, refuses to look at the past, re refuses to look at the African American as an actual human being, but is, um, views the African American, or as the term he uses, the Negro, as uh, really as an as, as in a way that is not commensurate with his humanity. Um, and that, that this is a uh, fundamental problem of the society and that artists have the imperative, the responsibility to tell the truth, um, to tell their truth, um, and to aid the society in um, coming to grips with its uh, past and its present. And uh, he hopes that um, this will be able to, this will happen in the United States, but he's far from certain that it will. Okay, so, you know, this is a, this is a brief introduction to these, um, these uh, dialogues and interviews, and I hope that, uh, that it's somewhat useful as you consider um, the role of the arts as, as discussed um, in these clips. All right, thank you.